cases, not in your environments, but global changes, modulating the ever-increasing tree, bush, or whatever of life created by microevolution in the Darwinian sense. So, this macroevolution comes in three versions. One is negative, and that's the big mass extinctions that were uh, have been discussed in in extent and about the five big ones and the six that we are presently making, and I would say a seventh at the end of the Proterozoic. Uh, I'm not going to talk about, uh, much about that except in the last deep sea part. The next is Golden Ages, uh, a thing that my uh, my supervisor Otto Harsch in the Wolf uh, built upon, and he ex he observed this phenomenon, Golden Ages, namely certain. Uh, certain ages in which not only the diversity reaches uh, unexpected levels, but also uh, the forms become extreme, extravagant, crazy, and soon after they die out. Now, in the terms of that time, he called that, in a, uh, in a hypostrophism theory, he called that they became decadent. But of course, in a, what we call that orthogenetic thinking. Uh, that is impossible because the Darwinian process of selection can only select for better forms, not decadent, that means less adaptive forms. So that is impossible. So why should there be a connection? Of course there can be an, a select, uh, uh, an explanation in very simple terms. The very high level of individual evolution, these forms that appear to us strange, extravagant, decadent, were perfectly adapted. They were better adapted than their more normal uh, ancestors. But adapt adaptation means specialization for certain environmental conditions. And specialization means vulnerability. Just imagine you would have a power failure over the whole country for one day. It would be a catastrophe. hundred years ago, it would hardly have been felt. That means our vulnerability. And I'm not going to ladies that need a special kind of perfume or anything. <laughs> vulnerability increases with the specialization. So that's the connection between golden ages and following mass extinctions. So things get ready for an extinction, of course that's wrong, but they get in a favorable time too specialized for unforeseen global events. The next thing is we have golden biotopes. Uh, golden biotopes, that's what we look for when we go to the zoo and the botanical garden because you, you don't go to the botanical garden to see the trees and the plants that you see in the forest nearby. You want to see, and in the zoo, you want to see the exotic animals of a golden biotope, golden, obviously, by the favorable climate in the tropics, tropical reefs, tropical rainforests, 
So that is, uh, in a way, uh, understandable. But I will go on and tell you about golden biotopes that do not look golden to us and still there. Deep sea is one of them. Now, let's go into golden ages. Famous experiment, uh, uh, example are uh, Cretaceous ammonites that become really crazy instead of the regular spiral. They make they unroll at a certain time, have countdown programs, and in the final stage, they swim, for instance, this upper. You see this form first started straight shell, then made a loose coil, then made the countdown with the final aperture, growing up. Now an ammonite, if modeled after Nautilus, should have the jet going out there. So it could only dive down with the jet. No. It could not swim with the jet sideways. So obviously they are maladapted if we use the model of the present pearly nautilus that happens to have a similar basic construction, namely that of a buoyant shell with gas chambers that increase at the buoyancy increases with the growth and the weight of the animal so that they are neutrally buoyant but this model should not be applied literally. Uh, we have no time, but uh, I would love to show you ammonites did have a completely different lifestyle from the modern nautilus, apart from the basic construction of the shell. Okay, so uh, you see this very strange thing and if you roll it up, <coughs> you get certain steps that what I call iterative countdowns and they grow to, or here, grow from one stage in which they had some time and were happy and then grew half a, a, a curve and half a curve and half a curve and half a curve and half a curve and so they grew in rhythms and were happy in between, enjoying uh, working only in making the shell during short periods in life. So, a different lifestyle and therefore perfectly adapted, but marking the end of the trilobite, uh, the, of the ammonites in at the end of the Mesozoic. Uh, at the end of the Cretaceous, and we all know that the asteroid impact in Yucatan was responsible for that global change was the killer. In the Permian and Permian mass extinction, you have a similar phenomenon in many groups. Well, in the Cretaceous, of course, I could have talked about dinosaurs and their crazy size and or shapes uh, about the rudists, about the balanites, about the marine reptiles, ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs and all, all the rest. Similar, in the Permian there are many groups that are out here, it's just one group of strange echinoderms and as Dave Meyer is here I thought I have to bring one echinoderm <laughs> example, uh, a kind of, of uh, Crinoids, but crinoids that have no arms, but uh, so-called brachioles or feeding elevated on the long stem, 